Hello everyone, this is Andrew with Novus Computers and NovusComputers.com. Today we are going to be starting a new video series called Computing 101. This series is going to be designed for people who are computer novices. And what I mean by a computer novice is somebody who either doesn't use their computer a lot or does use their computer quite a bit but is still not sure exactly, you know, where everything is, you know, in Windows or, you know, what's going on with their computer and they would like to be a little bit more up to speed on being able to use their computer to a fuller extent. So this is going to be a multi-part video series uh, and the first set of videos that we are going to be covering is Windows 10 and Windows 10 Basics. So for this first video we are going to be covering the Windows 10 Start menu uh, pretty much from top to bottom. We're going to cover quite a bit of features here. I'm going to try and keep this video fairly short, but I'm still going to try and be as thorough as I possibly can. So if you want to go ahead and follow along, go ahead and click subscribe. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Novus Computers. Uh, you can also follow along on our website, which is novus-computers.com. Again, that is novus as in a hyphen or a minus sign, computers.com. So without further ado, let's get started. So right here you can see we have our Windows 10 desktop. Um, I started off with a very clean profile so that that way your desktop may vary a little bit, but it should be fairly similar to this. So the first thing we're going to look at is the Windows 10 start menu. Now I'm going to take this in a couple of sections here. The first one we're going to look at here are tiles. This is a carryover from Windows 8 and 8.1. So anybody who's previously used Windows 8 or 8.1 should be fairly familiar with these. Uh, if you're not, then most of this can be backtraced to Windows 8.1. So a lot of the things that we'll cover here can also be covered in 8.1 as a lot of it is backwards compatible. Uh, next up we're going to do is look at our most used section, followed by our profile section, as well as the file explorer and settings buttons. And then finally we'll take a look at our search bar down here at the bottom. So first up is tiles, and we're going to split this into two sections first. There's two different types of tiles, uh, in essence. There is a static tile, which is essentially just a glorified icon. Uh, tiles like photos here, or actually more accurately, stuff like groove music, uh, things like OneNote here, those are static tiles. Other tiles, you know, that could be considered static would be stuff like Microsoft Edge um, and things like that, Phone Companion, so on and so forth. These are just glorified icons, really. You go ahead, you click on it, it brings up the application, you carry on with your day. The other one is Live Tiles. Now, if you look at the screen here, you'll see that there's several things going on here uh, with some of these different tiles. Uh, you'll notice that they're kind of flipping back and forth between different things. And this is what is known as a live tile. And what it's doing is it's currently downloading information from the internet for whatever application you know the tile references. And it's displaying it right in the tile itself. So if you look over here, we have our news tile, and you can see that there is a news headline here, as well as it flips back to a picture, you know, bearing of the news article itself. If we look over here at our, say, Twitter feed, then it'll actually show images and tweets from, you know, Twitter if you are signed up through there. Uh, if you're signed up through Twitter and following Nova's computers, perhaps you'll see one of our tweets uh, listed in that tile at some point. Other tile, live tiles are, say, like the weather app, which if you have your weather location set, you will see current temperature, date, and everything for your location, which is kind of handy. And other apps could be like the store app, which will showcase highlighted apps, um, other things that you can download, so on and so forth. Uh, the calendar and mail apps can also be configured for a live tile. The mail app will show, for instance, recent email messages you may have received, uh, whereas the calendar will show you appointments throughout your day. So all of these tiles share several common characteristics. It doesn't matter if they're static or if they're live. They all share these characteristics. The first of which is reorganization. Now, a lot of people I talk to don't really realize that you can do this, and half the time they'll do it without even realizing they've done it. However, you can rearrange these tiles in almost any fashion you wish. 
And all you have to do in order to do that is simply drag and drop. So if we go ahead and left click on any one of these tiles, for instance, if I want to move this mail tile to this column over here instead, all I have to do is left click on it, hold down my mouse button and drag it over here to this column. And as you can see, it now resides over here where I prefer to have it. So if I wanted to move, say, my Groove Music and Movies and TV over to this column, again, just left click and drag it over and then release once you've got it where you want it, and it will place it there. So you can basically have these tiles arranged in any fashion that you prefer. You know, if you want them set, you know, to make up certain patterns or you know, sequences of tiles, you can do that. That's not a problem at all. They will kind of form and flow around one another uh, rather nicely. So for instance, if I want to drag the store app up into this section right here, obviously it's not normally going to fit. But if I go ahead and drag it up anyway, you can see that the two Microsoft Edge and Weather tiles just drop below it and stack up underneath. So you can really be flexible with how you position your tiles or where you you know, put certain shortcuts to different applications and whatnot. So they're really flexible that way. Another thing you can do is you can also drag entire groups of tiles. So as you can see, we have two groups right here at the moment. One is called Life at a Glance and one is called Play and Explore. And if we want, we can actually click up where this title is and we can drag this entire group and position it underneath, say, this second group here. So now we have two groups that are stacked on top of each other. So you can, again, be very, very flexible with how you position your tiles. You can also create new groups. Uh, there's a couple different ways in which you can do that. The easiest way to do it, which I'll cover here, is basically just dragging a tile into an empty space. So, for instance, if I want to drag this news, uh, at this news tile over into its own group, I'll just left-click, drag, and as you can see, there's kind of a bluish bar that appears uh, in this empty space just above where I've got the tile um, move to. And if I release the My Mouse button, it will place that in its own group. Now, oops, I just lost the start menu there. So as you can see, if we go ahead and place a tile there, I'll go back into the start menu here and get our news tile back, which I will show you this trick here in a little bit. If we go ahead and drag that news app anyway back up to here, you can see it's placed it in another group. So if we hover just above that group, we actually find a spot where we can name that group. So again, all it is is it's just a simple left click, and we can name this whatever we want. So now I have a mail app as well as my news app located right where I'm going to need to be able to access them at all times. If I say, you know, want to keep money news also, you know, available to me, I can simply drag that tile up into this group. Uh, perhaps I want to have my calendar up there as well. I can drag and drop that and place that in there. And I can actually arrange them however I want. If I want to, again, drag this group underneath and place it so that it sits right underneath of the rest of those, I can do that. Again, it's just left click and drag. Very simple, very easy. Another characteristic that all tiles have in common is the ability to resize those tiles. And as you can see, when the start menu for some reason closed on me and I lost that news tile, I brought it back, but it's smaller than it was previously. Which, what if I wanted to actually make it the size that it was? So we can do that simply by right-clicking on this tile and coming down here to Resize and then picking whichever size tile we want. So for instance, if I want to make it it's the size that it was previously, I simply select Wide. And as you can see, it now makes that tile as wide as it previously was. And again, you can also see how it causes the rest of these tiles to move down and just kind of fill in and form around the rest of these tiles. So if I wanted to, say, resize this to a large tile, it'll push these tiles down even further. If I want to take this back and make it, say, a small tile, they, pop, they pull themselves up and it just becomes a small icon here. So again, you can left click and drag 
place it wherever you want, and then simply right click it, resize it to whatever size you want. So while I'm in the right click menu here, there are a couple of other things that we can do. And the first one is unpin from start, which if you have a couple of different say, app, whether they be applications or just tiles in general that you don't really need or want in your Start Menu Tiles section or your Pin section is, as it's known, then you can simply right-click on that tile and click Unpin from Start, and that will remove that tile from your Tiles menu here. So, for instance, if I come down here to this uh, Candy Crush Soda Saga game and right-click on it, I can click Unpin from Start, and that tile is now gone. It has now been completely removed from my pin section, so now I can actually focus on putting stuff in there that I actually want instead of having it filled up with things that I don't want. Another thing that you can do by right-clicking on a tile is you can also, in the case of live tiles, turn those live tiles off. So if I go ahead and click on Turn Live Tile Off on our News tile here, it simply becomes a regular static tile. So again, a static tile is nothing more than just a glorified icon, which if you open the Start menu, you click on the tile, it opens the application. There's no extra, there's no extra information that's going to be conveyed or anything along those lines. You're not going to have pictures or news headlines or whatever else that tile may convey to you. If you want to simply turn it back on so that it is a live tile again, you just right click on that tile and click turn live tile on. And that will immediately cause it to fill back in and start updating with information. Now I will warn you that some tiles can be made into live tiles, other tiles cannot. So for instance, Edge here that's available as a live tile, but for instance, if I say wanted to bring calculator over here, which again, I'll show you how to do this momentarily, and right click on it, there really isn't a live tile here for calculator. There's, yeah, it shows that there's a live tile and it's on, but it's still not going to show me any information or anything other than what's there currently. The same could be said if I brought, say, notepad over here, and I right click on it. As you can see here, there isn't even a turn live tile on or off option because Notepad is just a static icon. There's nothing here that can be updated with information or anything along those lines. So again, if I wanted to remove these, I simply right click and click unpin from start. And that will remove them from this tile section. So also in the right click menu here is an option to pin to taskbar. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar as to exactly what the taskbar is in Windows, the taskbar is this section all the way along the bottom here, which for this purpose of demonstration, it is black. Uh, depending on what version of Windows you are running, it might be clear, it might be blue, it might be kind of a blackish color if you're running an older version of Windows, such as Vista. Um, but nevertheless, no matter what color it is, it is called the taskbar. So by pinning an app to a taskbar or a tile to a taskbar, we simply can cause it to join. I'll simply click on it here. As you can see, it brings up an icon down here now. Now this tile is pinned to the taskbar, so I don't even have to open the start menu to open this application now. I can simply be here at my Windows desktop, click on this, and it immediately appears and is ready to go. I don't even have to come into the start menu, find my news app, and click on it to open it up. I simply come down here, one click, done. If you have a couple of things down here, and I know this isn't exclusively dealing with the Start menu, but if you do have a couple of pinned apps down here, you can unpin them by right-clicking on the taskbar ver I version of the icon and click Unpin this program from taskbar, and that will remove it. It will still, however, be here in your Start menu. Finally, in the right-click menu, we have Uninstall. Uh, by clicking this, it will allow you to uninstall the application. Now, there's a couple of caveats to this one, and the reason I say that is because if it is a what is known as a Metro app, so for instance, News here is a Metro app. It could be downloaded from the Windows Store. Any, any application that is downloaded from the Windows Store, which can be located... Not sure where I'm at here with all the uh, everything. 
Oh, here it is right here. Any application downloaded from this Windows Store can be considered a Metro app. So if I have a Metro app here, say the for instance the news application, I can right click it, click uninstall, and if I click this uninstall button, it will remove that app from my computer. And once it's gone, it's gone. For other applications though, that doesn't quite work the same way. If it's an actual regular application, so for instance, if I have brackets here, we'll move this over here and put it down, and I right click on it and click uninstall, it brings up the programs and features section of the control panel, which allows me to, to scroll through all of the applications that are, all of the regular applications that are installed on this computer, and then be able to, you know, pick one, uninstall it, go from there. So you do have to kind of be careful. You, if you're going to uninstall something, you'll want to make, you know, if it's a Metro app, you'll be able to do everything right from the start menu here. If it's a regular type of application, like say an application like you would be using, for instance, Brackets here, or Photoshop, Microsoft Office, uh, lots of other different applications that you may have to un you know, install manually and you don't download it from the Windows Store, you will have to right click it and click uninstall, then find it in this list, click on it, and then click uninstall. So that should do it for tiles for the most part. Um, again, just kind of recapping here, we have two different tiles. One is static tiles, which are basically nothing, again, more than glorified icons. You click it, the application opens, that's all there is to it. The other type are live tiles, which will allow you to have them convey information to you. Uh, again, the type of information that particular tile will convey depends on the application it deals with. So for instance, a news application tile will give you news headlines. Your mail tile will give you email, uh, new email, current email, any of that type of stuff. Uh, calendars will give you calendar-related information. Uh, social media apps, whether that be Twitter, Facebook. Uh, as you can see, we have Flipboard here. Those will give you, you know, updated content for whatever social network those end up dealing with. So, moving on we're going to go ahead and start looking at our all apps section as well as our most used section. And the first one we're going to look at here is our most used section, which this is sort of an automatic list. As you use your computer, you will have different applications that you use all the time. And as you use these applications, they will start to work their way up this list. Now you have to use your computer a bit before you'll start noticing things start working their way up this list, but slowly but surely they will in fact do that. So for instance, if I were to open, you know, Microsoft Edge here several dozen times, it will start to work its way up this list and then eventually it'll get to the top. This is simply just a one-click access, you know, for any application that you might use that you don't have pinned over here. So as you can see, all of these applications that are listed here are not pinned over here. If I was to pin one of these applications over here, then it would disappear from this list and would not appear again until I were to either unpin it from this list or simply drag it off screen. So moving from this list into our all apps section, this is the same, this button here is the same thing as the All Programs button in Windows 7 was, and Windows Vista, and Windows XP, and pretty much just about all the way back through Windows 95 um, had some form of this menu. Basically what it does is it outlines every piece of software that is currently installed on your computer, every piece of third party as well as Windows based software. So if it's a Windows Store app, it will be listed in here. If it is a third party software that did not come from the Windows Store that you installed either via disk or download, it should appear in here. Uh, about the only thing that will not appear in here is personal files. So if it's a program that needs to be run, it should appear in this list. And again, as you start opening and using these programs, they will start working their way up this particular list here, this most used list. And it will give you, again, one-click access to be able to go into the Start menu here, find what you want, open it up, and you can go. Instead of having to do multiple clicks by opening the Start menu, going to All Apps, 
scrolling to whatever you're looking for, and then opening it up. There are two ways to open this All Apps drawer. And the first one is the most obvious by clicking this button. However, the second one is more so designed for touch interface users, but it does work for the mouse as well. If you are down in this area here, and you simply left click, drag up, it will open your All Apps section. So it's not really going to be necessarily a useful feature for people who are using a mouse, but if you're using a touch interface or if you just like to impress your friends, it is kind of a fun thing to do. Again, it's just left click, hold the mouse button down and drag your mouse up and it will immediately cause the all apps drawer to open. So again, all apps, there are also different folders within this, within this section that will have different applications in them. Uh, so, for instance, if I come up here under Adobe, you can see that I have a couple different Adobe applications installed. Um, if I come down further down here, you can see my Komodo Internet Security has its own folder. Uh, just because there are, is a folder there doesn't mean you have to use them. You know, use folders for whatever icons you have. It's just kind of whatever your application decides to, you know, do when it goes and installs uh, your application's icons. So now that we've kind of covered the all apps section as well as the most used section, we're going to go about how to take icons from this menu and this menu and bring them over here into this section. So in order to do that, it gets, again, very, very simple. All you need to do is wherever the icon that or application that you want to pin to your start menu, which this is considered your pinned area, if you want to pin a particular item to your start menu, it's as simple as dragging and dropping it over into where you want it to go. So again, let's drag and drop, left click, hold, drag it over to where you want it, let go of the mouse button. Bam, it's right there, ready, for to, ready to go for you whenever you need it. Two-click access, start menu, application, ready to go. The other way you can do it is by right-clicking on whatever particular app. Now, again, we can do that from over here. We can either, again, click and drag, which in this case, this brackets application is already pinned, which, as you can see, if you try to drag something that already exists in your pin section, you'll get that error message right there. It says already pinned. That will let you know that, hey, this is already there someplace, so you know we're not going to pin it twice. So, for instance, if I try and drag, you know, calculator over here, I'm in the all apps section. So, if I go ahead and try and drag calculator over here, it'll drag and drop. If I were to try it again, again, you get the already pinned item. The other way you can do it is you can right click on an application. And if I can find one that actually isn't pinned, we'll go ahead and find one here. Here we go. We'll just do Firefox here good old trusty Firefox. If we right click on it, we can also click pin to start, which if we click on pin to start, puts that icon right over here. Now it won't necessarily, you know, put it exactly where you might want it. Say for instance, I want this icon down here. It may not put it there for you, but again, it's very, very simple to simply just left click, drag and drop it wherever you want it to be after it's pinned. So it's very flexible in how you do, you know, arrange your icons or how you pin your icons over here. Um, you can pretty much drag and drop them wherever you want, and you can pin them from, you know, wherever you need. From the start menu, just drag and drop. That's all there is to it. If we look over here in the right-click menu, um, over here in the All Tabs or All Programs section, we can see that there's another right-click menu that's very, very, very similar to the one that we get if we right-click in our tiles. As you can see, we have unpin from start, which obviously Firefox is pinned over here. So if we click unpin, it will remove it. Or we have pin to start if the item is not already pinned. Uh, we have pin to taskbar, which I touched on that earlier. It will simply put it in that row of icons down here. Uh, uninstall, which Again, we covered that previously. Uh, if it's a Metro app, you can simply click uninstall and it will ask you, 
Are you sure? You'll click on install, it will remove it. If it is a third party program or a non store app, then clicking on uninstall will bring up this right here. Or you can then go and find your application, click on it, click on install. Run as administrator is something that you can use. It ne won't necessarily work for Windows uh, store-based applications, but for third-party applications or more or less traditional Windows applications, right-clicking and running as administrator will allow that to run with administrative access rights. So in some cases, some programs might need to be run as administrator. Most of the time, you will not need to run a program as an administrator. Um, it's not recommended that you do so on a daily basis simply due to security reasons. But if you are being helped by somebody and they ask you to, you know, run a file as an administrator or, you know, open a command prompt as an administrator, then right clicking on whatever application they're asking you to run and clicking run as administrator will bring up this window, which as you can see, this is a limited user account, so I have to ask my administrator account for its password in order to continue. Um, if you're already on an administrative account, it will simply bring up a box asking you, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your PC? You click yes, that's all there is to it. So again, administrative rights, I'm not going to get too far into it uh, in this video, but if you need to run something as administrator uh, from the all apps menu, you right click on it and it's right there. Uh, finally, open file location. Again, if it is a third-party app, not a Windows app, so if it's a Windows Store app, you see that it doesn't appear here. But if it's a third-party app, you can, or if it's a shortcut to a third-party app, you click Open File Location, and it will open in File Browser the path location for that third-party shortcut, where you can actually see, you know, all the other shortcuts to everything else. And if you right-click on it again, go to Properties, or if you can come up here to Open File Location it will actually open that program's file location. So it's a little wonky. You probably aren't going to use it too terrible much, um, but it can be kind of handy if you have a program or something that's in this all apps section and you're not sure what it is or where it came from. You can simply open file location. You'll see the shortcut here. Right click on it again, open file location, and you can see exactly where on your computer it is up here in your address bar as well as all the other files that are associated with it. So again, typically not something that most new or novice computer users are going to find much use of, but it is there. So we're going to cover it. So moving on, we are going to go ahead and jump up here to the account uh, section here. I don't think there is too much more in the all apps section that I need to cover, so we're just going to go ahead and move on. If I think of something later, I'll go ahead and append it. Uh, our account button up here doesn't really look like a button, so to speak, uh, but believe it or not, it actually is, and by clicking on it, it gives us a couple different options. Uh, the first of which is here at the bottom. If we have multiple accounts or multiple user accounts on this on a single PC, you can actually view other accounts that are either signed in or not signed in, um, and you can also switch between those accounts. So for instance, I wanted to switch to my main account on this particular computer. I simply click on it. It would switch me out of this account here and would switch, switch me to the login screen for my main account. Uh, if you have a password for your another account or if that account that I would want to switch to has a password, I would have to enter that password before I could sign in. Um, if you don't, then it will simply present you with a little button that says sign in, you click it, and boom, here you are. Moving up, we have sign out as well as lock. Uh, sign out obviously will close any applications that you have running. Um, make sure you save your work before clicking this button because if you do click sign out and have unsaved work, that work will be lost. Um, basically what this does is it just signs you out of Windows and returns you to the main sign-in screen. What lock does is 
lock will cause the computer to go back to the sign-in screen. However, it will not sign you out. If you have work or unsaved items that you know are currently being worked on, this will not cause you to lose any added or um, saved progress. So basically what this does is it's useful if you have a computer password and you need to leave for five minutes and you don't want anybody you know, messing around with whatever you're working on, you could simply lock the computer and then that person would have to know the password to sign back in and do anything. Uh, so it's kind of handy for those quick, you know, five minute, oh, I got to run to go do something. You simply come to the start menu here, click your your account button, click lock, and that will lock the computer so that nobody else can touch it until, you know, you come back and enter the password in. If you do not have a password on your account, um, it doesn't do you quite as much good. Uh, for instance, if I were to lock this session here, as you can see, it brings up this wonderful little sign-in screen, which if I click, it brings this screen up, which I just click sign in, and voila, I'm back. So finally, we have our change account settings button, which if we click this button, it brings us into our account settings here, which we can use to change things like our picture. So for instance, if I wanted to make this guy my picture, I can do that. And as you can see, now it appears here. Uh, you can also browse your computer for other files. Um, right now, these are the default account pictures, but if you have other pictures on your in your pictures folder or anything else, you can also take a picture. Um, with a webcam if you have one equipped. Uh, you can also change sign-in options such as adding a password or a PIN or a picture password. Um, you can also upgrade a couple of different policies for you know doing things, setting things up like other, other system properties, you know whether that be accessing shared resources at work or school, stuff like that, as well as sync settings. Um, sync settings is kind of an interesting feature. Um, I'll touch more on this later, but basically what it allows you to do is if you are using a Microsoft account, which you have to be using one in order to access these features, it will allow you to have your, for instance, your, your, your wallpaper. So this picture back here, as well as your user profile picture and web browser settings language preferences, other stuff, it will sync across computers. So for instance, if you have a desktop that's set up, you know, just the way you like it, and you have a laptop and you want it to look the same exact way when you sign into your laptop as it does on your desktop, you can do that. Again, you have to have a Microsoft account to enable that feature uh, signed in, but you don't need to worry about, you know, having to recreate everything manually. That is one of the very nice things about having a Microsoft account on your computer um, and being signed in with it is that it will cause you to, you know, have all of those settings synced all the way across. So wrapping things up here real quick, we're going to look at our final set of buttons here. Um, what we have here is File Explorer, which this is your traditional Windows file browser. If we bring it up here, you can see it brings up this window here. I'm going to touch on this window in another video simply because there is a lot of content to cover here. There is different tabs and different features in all of those tabs. There are different sections here. Um, so for instance, frequent folders are folders that you frequently visit. So that next time, similar to this most used apps section, this is a section for different folders and stuff that you, you know, use quite a bit. Recent files is something that is kind of interesting. If you're working on a document or something and you saved it, but you need to be able to get quick access back to it, you can simply come on here and it should be listed within this you know, set of recent files. I don't remember exactly how many recent files this remembers offhand. I believe it's close to 30, but it might be more, it might be less. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it basically will give you a whole bunch of different files you know that you've accessed or used recently. So that's just kind of a quick overview of the File Explorer. Again, I'll touch more on depth in this in a future video in this series. Um, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and leave it at that. 
So finally, we have our settings button, which brings up this window here. Um, this is going forward the replacement for the Windows control panel. Uh, right now, the control panel does still exist. However, a lot of the features from it have been moved into this section here. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a goofy hybrid right now. If you can't find the setting or, you know, function that you're trying to accomplish in this menu, then you might need to go into the control panel and, you know, try and find, you know, what you're looking for in there. Because it chances are, if it's not in here, it's probably still likely in the control panel. Um, again, I will touch on all of these settings here in a future video. Um, in fact, they're probably going to split several of these sections up into multiple videos simply because if there was a lot of information in the File Explorer window, there's even more information here. So uh, again, there's a lot of stuff to cover here. So we're going to go ahead and split that into separate videos for you. So finally, we have our power button here, which my phone keeps going off here. Our power button here um, gives us three options. It gives us sleep, shut down, and restart. So sleep basically will put the computer to sleep, and it puts it into a low power state. It's not off. However, it allows you to wake the computer much more quickly and be able to you know, utilize, you know, functions even quicker. If you have unsaved work that you are, you know, want to return to later, you can put the computer to sleep and it will save all of that stuff. And so that when you go back and bring the computer back up, it's all there and ready for you to go. Shutdown will shut down the computer immediately. Um, be very careful because there is, once you click this button, there is no going back typically. Um, it will cause the system to start shutting down immediately and will not ask you to save any work that you have going on. So it's very important that you save anything that you've got going on and then click shut down. Uh, restart is much the same way. Uh, the only difference between shutdown and restart is that unlike shutdown, which will turn the computer completely off, uh, restart will cause the system to restart and will bring you back to the Windows login screen and back to your desktop. Um, again, it will cause you to lose any unsaved information, so make sure you have everything saved before you click restart because otherwise you will lose that information. So finally, we're going to take a quick look here at the search bar. Um, the search bar in Windows 10 is actually much easier to find than it was in Windows 8, and it's much more functional than it was in Windows 7. In Windows 7, it was kind of down here in this area of the screen um, in the Start menu, and in Windows 8, you actually had to come over over here to the left or to the right side, excuse me, of the screen, and kind of mouse along the edge, find the search button, click on it, then search from there. It's much easier to access. It's actually straight a part of the taskbar, which you can see right here. It's you know available instantly. Um, and you can also access it by clicking the Start button, and you can immediately start typing whatever it is you want to you know search for. One of the nice things about it is that it is much, much more powerful than any previous search bar within Windows. You can not only search for applications on your PC, so for instance, if I wanted to search for brackets again, I can start typing it in and it immediately appears up here. You can also use it to search for files on your PC. So if you have a document or something that you've saved and named and you can't seem to find it because it wasn't quite where you thought you saved it, you can simply type the name of the file that you're looking for and it will scan through your entire PC and find that file for you. And finally, if those two things weren't enough, you can actually use it to perform web searches right from your taskbar uh, by doing a search for a web term Whoops, that probably wasn't the greatest one to try. <laughs> um, as you can see, if we start typing here, we can actually hit enter and perform a web search, which will immediately bring up a search for whatever subject matter you know, you're looking for. Um, I will give you one caveat that the search bar is limited to a Bing search only. 
So if you want to search using Google or Yahoo or another search engine of choice, you will need to open up an internet browser and go to that search engine of choice and go from there. This is only limited to a Bing search, which I'm not going to badmouth Bing or say anything negative about it. Um, it's a fine search engine, but to each their own, if you prefer Google, um, I personally prefer Google, uh, but if you prefer Yahoo, then you'll have to open up, go to yahoo.com and perform your web search from there. So that's a quick rundown of the search bar. The other thing this search bar houses is Microsoft's Cortana, which Cortana is a smart assistant, just like Apple Siri or Google Now. Um, I'm not going to touch too far into you know what Cortana is or what all she can do for you right now. You can kind of see as I scroll through here some of the things that she can do for you. Again, she's a smart assistant, just like Apple Siri or Google Now. So um, she can do a lot of the same exact things that both of those engines can. Um, you know, for instance, they can set reminders, set dates, uh, look up information for you. You can dictate letters, emails, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot that she can do. She does require a Microsoft account to use. So you will need to be signed in using a Microsoft account in order to get access to all that Cortana can do. Um, one of the other cool things is that She's not just a text-based, you know, assistant. If you have a microphone, um, you can actually speak uh, to your PC, and Cortana will be able to do everything, you know, all the things that you know you can do just by typing in the commands. So that's just a quick rundown of the possibilities there. Um, again, I will cover this in a future video. Uh, Partially because, again, there's a lot of information to cover here, but also because I obviously don't have a Microsoft set up on this account just yet. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll get that set up and then we'll go ahead and dive into Cortana. So that should give you a basic rundown of the start menu in Windows 10. Uh, again, there's a lot of carryover here from things from Windows 7 and Windows 8, so a lot of the stuff should be fairly familiar if you've used either of those two operating systems. Um, and if you're still using either of those two operating systems, there's a lot of stuff there that can, you know, cross over. Um, one of the things I have not covered yet is the ability to use the Start menu, also this right-click menu, which is very, very handy. Um, if you simply right click on the start menu, you will get a menu here of all kinds of different um, useful features for doing things like uninstalling programs, uh, changing control panel options, the task manager, uh, you can run different level command prompts. Um, a lot of this stuff you typically aren't going to use too terrible much, um, especially if you're not you know, a power user. But it is nice to know that, you know, this is here and accessible um, because if you happen to be on a tech support call with somebody or something and they ask you, you know, bring up the control panel or, you know, bring up an admin command prompt um, or, you know, run this particular program, you have these options here at your fingertips. Uh, but anyway, before I got sidetracked, um, the start menu does have a option to be more like a Windows 8 type start menu and allow you to have, you know, lots of different applications and stuff here. Um, I believe that option is here under settings. Yep, if you go to settings and personalization and start, you can kick this use start full screen to on. So we'll go ahead and do that here real quick. And now if we click our start button, you can see it fills up our entire screen. So all of our pin tiles, you know, now fill up the entire screen. If we want to access all of our applications, you know, like the All Apps button, it's simply down here. And you can see it move, brings this up over here on the left side of the screen, which is handy. Um, and again, clicking back brings that back there. Our Power button is also right here. So if we need to, you know, for instance, turn the computer off, we just click on this. And we can pick our Sleep, Shut Down, Restart, etc. So again, that is under... This is also allows us to bring in our most used apps as well as our file explorer settings and everything, uh, just so you know. That is under settings, personalization, start, and then use start full screen. So if you're a Windows 8 user and you really like the idea of the full start screen, um, or if you're using Windows 10 on a 
hybrid tablet or even a full tablet, um, using the full start screen can be very handy since it's a lot more touch friendly than using the traditional start menu, which is more designed for mouse and keyboard users. So that should wrap it up for the Windows 10 start menu. Um, if you have any sort of questions or anything, be sure to leave a comment or suggestion down below the video. Um, and again, this will become a bi-weekly series of part of Computing 101. Um, next week, we will be likely be taking a look at our either Microsoft Edge or we will take a closer look at the File Explorer. Um, another couple of things that we'll probably be touching on in the future is desktop personalization as well as window management. Um, so those are a couple things that, again, a lot of people know of but don't quite know exactly how they work. Um, and especially in the window management section, a lot of people don't even know, you know, what it is or how to utilize it. So we'll be covering those topics here uh, in future videos. Uh, but for now, again, this has been Andrew with Novus Computers, noviscomputers.com. Uh, thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe.